passage I will be reading it today. Uh, it comes from John chapter 1 and verse 14. Let's pray and ask God to open up our scripture to us now. Father, we delight to be called your children. We delight to be made aware of who you truly are through the wondrous gift of what we are taught each Christmas, that God the Son became human so that we might know you and even know ourselves, Lord, that we might lead a life pleasing to you and in the end be with you. In the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Hear God's word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, we come to that season in the Christian calendar where we are reminded of that wondrous doctrine of the Incarnation. What the world cannot receive, we have come to truly believe, and that is God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God, has become one of us. He has taken on perfect humanity, yet with a perishable body. Now, the worldling sees such doctrine, first of all, as impossible, and secondly, irrational. But the Christian response even easily overcomes both objections. Why should we consider it impossible that the same Word of God who spoke all things into existence could not himself come to be one of us? Now, if you reject the first part, you will find the second part impossible. If you reject that God the Word spoke all things into existence, you would find it rather impossible that God the Word could enter into that creation. But why should we consider it impossible that the same Word of God who made humanity could not send his own Son with a true human nature and body? Now, if you were Unitarian, that's a certain group of creatures, um, subset of Christianity that used to teach a heresy. And the heresy did not accept the doctrine of the Trinity, that God eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if you were Unitarian, the doctrine that God came to earth, humbled himself as a man, that might very well pose a real dilemma. It would pose an impossibility. If God's here on earth in the form of a humble Galilean carpenter, then who's running the universe? You see, that would be a real dilemma if you were Unitarian. It poses no problem for the Trinitarian. The Trinitarian says that God the Father sent God the Son to earth in order to rescue us. Secondly, we consider the doctrine, uh, the critique of the doctrine of the Incarnation, that it is irrational. You know, I find this critique most absurd because if God is not the standard of rationality, please tell me who is. You don't possibly mean to tell me that we are the people who are the standard of rationality. But see, that's the only choice left. We who create war, create violence, create envy and hatred among us, we're the standard of rationality? And so I find it most absurd, the critique of the one who doubts the Incarnation now turns his attention on the uh, offensive to say that that's somehow that mankind is the standard of rationality. If we deem it irrational, what God has chosen to do in the sending of his Son in the Incarnation, it only means that we need to repent it does not mean that we now have license to critique the Holy God who has chosen in his wisdom to send his son. Simply stated, irrational man complaining that God is irrational is the height of absurdity and blasphemy. Finally, I would answer those that speak against the incarnation suggesting that such a doctrine would somehow sully the word of God. But let me give you an illustration. Is it not the case that the sun shines on the noble and the ignoble parts of the earth? Is it not the truth that the sun shines on the glorious mountains as well as the marsh pits? Does that somehow sully the beauty and the glory of the sun? No. The truth of the matter is, 
God coming to earth in the person of Jesus Christ in no way sullies the deity. No, the brightness of the sun enters our existence and lights upon all things alike. And here's the neat thing about God, the sun, when he came to earth. He came to earth in such a way that he was neither sullied by our sin nor calloused by our miseries. I think if I should be sent to a group of people who are as stubborn as we are, as hard-headed as we are, as wayward as we are, I would at least become calloused. You know what God is really, this reveals about God is this. He continuously demonstrates his pity and mercy upon each and every one of us. Now let's consider that the one who tries impossible and irrational is the very one who worships lifeless idols. To me, it's a great twist of irony that the very one who complains the doctrine of incarnation is both impossible and irrational are the very people who have filled human history with deaf, dumb, mute idols made of wood, silver, and gold. And this is supposed to be somehow more possible and more rational than the doctrine of the incarnation. Look now and see the critic who says impossible, carving an idol in the dirt. Look now and see the critic who says irrational, bringing a food offering to a deaf, dumb, mute idol. And I'm supposed to believe that that somehow is more possible and more rational then the Christian position, I don't buy it. Listen to what the Apostle Paul told the Athenians. Being then of God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. He says you can get a clue to what God is like by reasoning backwards. If you look at the piece of art, you can somewhat reason backward and see what the artist himself must be like. Well, you're not made of gold or silver or other expensive material, are you? No. You are a mind. You are a being. You have personality. You care about things. You love things. You disdain things. And these things all point back to your creator. You know the funny thing about idolatry? It both at the same time reveals something about us, but it also clouds our minds. Well, what does it reveal about us? It reveals we want God to be close to us. That's why they made idols and brought them into their households. They set them up on the mantelpieces and they looked at their deities every day. We want God to be close. Second thing it reveals is we need something to be small in front of. We have an innate, built-in need to be small in front of something. Secondly, I would say that idolatry seeks to uh, serves to um, cloud the mind because what winds up happening is we wind up projecting all of our worst hopes and fears onto this man-made deity. What does the passage say? He says they are formed by the art of and the imagination of mind. But God promises in the scriptures, anyone who goes after idols, I will be angry with him. I will judge him for the foolish confusion that he sows among the minds of men. In the book of Judges, God said, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. You see, what they were doing is they wanted a God who was close. They wanted a God who could deliver them. But through the art and the imagination and the ingenuities of their own minds, they made their own gods. You see, the worldling always resists the Christian doctrine that God has taken on our lowliness. In fact, he's taken on our humiliation. And so mankind would rather magnify the works of his own hands. Mankind would rather take the art of his mind, the thoughts of his mind, and make something in fashion. But here's my question, and here's my thought. And you answer this for me, please. If I make 
the God, and I assign to the God the theology that the God holds, why am I not God? Shouldn't the idol be worshiping me? If I made the God, and I assign the theology to the God, shouldn't it be worshiping me? You see who is irrational. It's not those who believe that God loved you enough to send his only son in the form of human kind. That's not who's irrational. The person who is irrational is the one who cries irrational and has filled world history with its idols. Next. The incarnation in order to restore creation. Now, one of the reasons that the world cannot receive the doctrine of incarnation, such things, is because they have rejected the very historical reason that there needed to be an incarnation, namely the fall in the garden. If you reject the need for a savior, which is Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit of the garden, if you count that as non-historical along the lines of any other mythology, if that's the way you count it, then there's no need for a savior. A humanity that did not eat the forbidden fruit doesn't need savior, requires no savior. But let me tell you, it's only the blindest fool who willingly refuses to look, who says, you know what, I think humanity's doing pretty good. I think humanity doesn't have any real problems. Are you kidding? You see, even the wayward, even the strayed, even those who teach horrendous doctrines at least typically will say this, humanity's got some serious problems. But unless you accept that God is the one who can fix them, you wind up going in a thousand wrong directions. Instead, we ought to say, God has become Emmanuel. That is God with us. God has come to rescue us from the sin and degradation that we had plunged ourselves into. We know from the scriptures that God is a spirit and does not have a body as we do. And yet, out of the great love that God had for mankind, you know what he did? He fashioned a body in the womb of the Virgin Mary so that he could become one of us. The scriptures explicitly state this. Consequently, when Christ came to the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. And by that, when we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What the author of Hebrews is doing here is he is quoting an Old Testament passage from the Psalms. And he is contrasting the bodies of the Old Testament animal sacrifices with the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. What those Old Testament animal sacrifices only typified, what they pointed to, the Lord Jesus Christ truly was. There was a miracle. The angel Gabriel told the young Virgin Mary, you're going to be with child. And she, she asked a very reasonable question. How can these things be? I've never been with a man. And the angel told her that the thing that shall be conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we as Christians understand. That God the Son took on real body and a reasonable soul being born of the Virgin Mary without any sin. Without the taint of the fall, he then could be the perfect human rightly make the point that God is seeking salvation of us poor creatures. But I want you to see that there's a broader plan. God's just not come for just us humans. God has come to restore all of the created order itself. The Apostle Paul makes this very point in the book of Romans. He says, for creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You see, Paul understands that the rebellion in the garden had catastrophic consequences beyond humanity. It plunged all the created order into the abyss of distance from God, being out of sync with one another. It is the 
explanation of why we need a Savior. And the beauty of Christmas, the wonder of the child in the manger, is God has come to earth in the form of Jesus Christ in order to bring us out of that bondage. We know from the scriptures in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how does he do that? Well, with the repeated phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said, all things came into being. And so that same word of God that was in the beginning with the Father speaking all things into existence has now come to the nativity of Bethlehem so that we might know who God is truly. Paul removes all doubt of this when he writes to the Colossians, for by him, Jesus, all things were created. Very plain statement. You with me? By Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and, and I love this last phrase, for him. Everything was created for Jesus. Why should we consider it a strange thing that an artist should be jealous over his masterpiece? Why should we consider it irrational that a creator, having become so estranged from his own creation, should desire to restore it to its former glory? If you were an artist and you had made the most gorgeous masterpiece ever known and it had somehow become despoiled, would you not desire to go into that masterpiece and if necessary, become part of the painting itself and recreate it to its former glory? Why should we consider it an impossibility? That the same word of God who created all things could not become that same word of God who could come and restore that very same creation. You see, the gospel is only irrational to those who are perishing. It makes no sense to them. But to us, it is our delight. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. What does it say? Nothing was made except the Word of God, Jesus Christ, made it. Nothing was made except Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made it. It is only those who willfully neglect the evidence of creating who will be so emboldened to speak of the universe in such a way that it is at the same time both its own effect and its own cause. Are you with me? That's the culture you live in. The culture you live in says the universe made itself accidentally. But if the universe haphazardly created itself, there's no divine mind behind the created order then Jesus necessarily must be haphazard. You get this? If the whole universe is haphazard, Jesus must be haphazard. If there's no mind behind the universe creating the universe, then there can't be, Jesus can't be sent with the mission because there'd be no one to send him. You get that? Jesus, if he's not sent because there's no one to send him, then he's not the Savior and you're still lost. I want you to see how the rejection of the doctrine of creation necessarily leads to the rejection of the doctrine of incarnation. But the universe we observe, we can see the telltale signs of the divine mind behind the universe. We see both beauty and diversity. If there were no divine mind behind the universe, you know what I'd expect? I'd expect to see only unity. And I'd expect only unity that tended towards the pragmatic. Distinctions would be null and void. But the distinctions of the things we observe suggest not a spontaneous generation. We see a divine mind. You know what I see when I see the universe? I see a God who not only made things for pragmatic purposes. I see a God who is in love with an artistic flair. From the beautiful butterfly to the mysteries of the hummingbird to smiling dollars, <laughs> I see a God who has a sense of humor. 
I see a God who has artistic flair. He's not just after the pragmatic. He's after beauty. And if his creation, if his artwork, if his canvas got spoiled, the message of Christmas is he cared enough about the entirety of his canvas to enter into it, to become part of it, in order to rescue it back to its former glory. The divine teaching of the Christian faith is there is a divine mind behind the universe who himself is the cause of the universe, and he himself is not molecularly part of the universe. That word of God did openly manifest himself as the creator when he walked among us. Think about what Jesus did. When he turned water to wine, when he walked upon the Sea of Galilee, when he fed 5,000 people with a voice, once you know what he was saying? I'm God over the universe. He was demonstrating he was God over the physical world. So, we are called to see by faith that God has made all things of the physical universe. The book of Hebrews tells us by faith we understand that the universe was created by what? By the word of God. And so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. I'm often amused at the geologist who spends his day in the hot sands trying to date the ages of rocks. Because I read very plainly that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. Geologists would do better to study the rock of ages than the ages of rocks. When you study the rock of ages, you get real wisdom. You start to understand not only the universe in which he made, but us and who we are and our true nature. The height of God's created order was humanity. The Bible says we were made a little lower than the angels. And it was humanity alone that God said that he made us in his image and after his likeness. You see, we plunged the height of God's created order. We were spoiled the best part of God's canvas when we rebelled against him. In order to rescue that, he sent the Lord Jesus Christ. Humanity had thrown away the most immeasurable birthright ever imagined, and for what? A piece of forbidden fruit. Now I want you to think about, stay with me, why would we want to do that? It was a very simple test. Adam and Eve, you can eat the, the pineapple, pomegranate, the cherries, the blueberries, the watermelons, the uh, cantaloupes, the leeks, the garlics, the onions. You can have all the glories of the garden, but this one tree in the midst of the garden, that's mine. Don't eat of it. Very simple test. Very simple prohibition. You know what mankind said when he ate that tree? I want to be my own law and my own God. And you hear it all the time. I want to make up my own rules for life. I want to go about my own way of living. I want to design my own thing. And by the way, that's nothing more than idolatry. Idolatry is I'm going to sit down with this piece of wood and I'm going to make my God. And by the way, I'm also going to make its theology for it. And then its theology, which was really God to begin with, is going to repeat back to me. So of course I'm good. Because I get to make the theology. When mankind does that, he makes himself confused. And once he starts down that road of confusion, he typically magnifies it. The warning of, in the day that you shall eat thereof, you shall surely die, had proved insufficient warning to a humanity that was determined to be its own God and its own law. Transgression against the simplest of prohibitions. And believe me, this was a very simple prohibition. If I can eat the pineapples and the plums and the melons and the watermelons, which I love, and the cherries and the blueberries, if I can eat all the glories of the garden and there's just one tree I'm not allowed to eat of, that's a very simple prohibition. But you see, when mankind did that, they marred their natures, but they also spoiled the artistic achievement of our God. When Adam was breathed into his nostrils, and mankind became a living soul, and he was brought forth as the glory and the height of God's creation. And the loss of that image, you know what it did? It put a distance between holy God and sinful man. And that's why people will say, I recognize something's wrong. 
I'm not sure what's wrong. But I know enough to know that something's not right. But you see, the problem is the person, we, who create the problem are completely incapable of fixing the problem. And sin so multiplied beyond the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the forbidden fruit, mankind became inventors of new evil, adulteries, thefts, murders, deviancies, sexual deviancies of a kind that mankind should have never even imagined. So God immediately set about calling. Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding in the bushes? Who told you you were naked? You see what that statement is? That statement is mankind recognizing his own embarrassment in front of a holy God. That's what that's all about. You see, we should have never been embarrassed before God. But you see, sin not only counted as a black mark against us, but sin actually changed our nature. Repentance, therefore, against future sins cannot undo the problem of past rebellions. Only God can fix that. The divine dilemma was this. God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. But God has a dilemma. Because if humanity is wiped out, if humanity is spoiled, it will ruin the glorious nature of the height of his created order. Do you see that? It will spoil the artwork. So what does God do? Instead of wiping us all out, which he would have had every right to do, he came to be one of us. Through our own negligence, through the deceit of evil spirits, we decided that we'll be smarter than God, make our own God, our own law, and our own rules, and it's only tended towards violence, confusion, and sadness. Rational man had become irrational as brute beast. He had put himself in an altogether ruinous estate, but praise to the eternal God that the word of God, that same word that spoke all things into existence, entered into the kindness of his painting, in order to rescue us. You see, the trespass, it counted not only as a black mark, as I said, it ruined our very nature. And ever since then, you know what mankind has been wanting to do? We wanted to get back to the garden. Back to where I'm not ashamed in front of my creator. Back to where I had peace with my fellow man. Back to where I had peace with myself and didn't hide in the bushes. We've been trying to get back to the garden but the broken pottery can't fix itself. What? The potter can. The potter who spoke all things out of nothing can enter into our humanity and cause humanity to emerge on the other side completely made whole. And that's what happened on the wondrous night in Bethlehem. When a scared young virgin and a confused but willing husband made their way to Bethlehem. Mystery of all. That he who was God of God, light of light, very God of very God, was born in Bethlehem. Come now and gaze at the infant in the straw and consider that the child that you see was in the beginning with the Father and the Spirit, equal in power and glory, begotten, not made. This is the wonder of Christmas that God says, I love people too much. I love my creation too much. Just to let it go. I'm coming to get you. If you're far from God, he's not far from you. You know, God had never been far from us, but he had never become one of us until he came to Bethlehem. He's coming to get you. Let's pray. Father, I do praise you that in your mercy and grace you didn't just let us go didn't just let us wander through this life with no answers, but you came to reveal yourself in such a beautiful and joy way in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might know you truly, and in the end, Lord, that we might be with you, Lord, that we might get back to the garden and better, because paradise is in store for all those who believe on the perfect name of Jesus, our Lord. It's in his name I pray. Stand for God's blessing. Come back tonight, preaching on Hosea again. God willing, that that will be a blessing to us all.
Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through 